come one more time and we will have some music uh, and songs to our God and hopefully that will also give us the, the uh, energy that we need to be awake as we hear the word of God. So join me please as we pray and you may st start standing because that's what the praise team will ask you to do. Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much, much for loving us the way you do. We thank you, Lord, for the provision that you always have uh, for your children. And this afternoon, as we come to the last uh, message of this weekend, we pray, Father, for a double portion of your spirit, that that work that wasn't completed in the afternoon, in the morning, excuse me, I pray, Father, that at this moment, we'll know completion, your divine completion. Touch our hearts, touch our minds. And may our lives be surrendered to you. It's our prayer in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise team. Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand up. I know Pastor said that we just had a great meal. I hope it was a good meal, but not too much, where we start seeing some head nods going through service. So let's use this time. If there is somebody you didn't get to say hi to during potluck or during church service, please walk around and let's go sit, shake some hands. Let's get some of that energy flowing back into our bodies. Start mingling, y'all. Jesus, the King of Kings is He, the Lord of Lords supreme through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the light, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Let's talk about Jesus. Like a 
fountain, I've got love, love like the ocean in my soul. Amen, amen. All right, guys, for this last song, we're going to need your help. This is going to be like a call and response type song. So if you know the song, please sing along. We'll have parts where we're going to sing, and then we're going to ask you guys to help sing. The words will be on there. We'll give you guys two examples to see how you guys got it, and then we'll go from there, OK? Sound good? Amen. You guys have to respond just the way that Sui and Natalia did, okay? Sing out loud, y'all. All right, let's go. Oh, love's come trickling down. Oh, love's come trickling down. Oh, love's come trickling down. Everybody. Thank you. You may be seated.
All right, one more time, one more time. Aiken. <laughs> How long should we wait for him? All right, so um, Pastor, Pastor um, Carlos has been busy. The Lord has been busy through his life. Um, all the blessings that he has bestowed upon those who has been, have been working with him. And we praise God for all that he has done through Pastor Carlos, especially during this weekend. Um, as you heard the bio before, he is the conference president for the Utah, Nevada conference. And... Uh, when you are in that position, you're pretty busy. So we, we definitely praise God for this time that the Lord chose for Him to be with us. And so we want to praise our God for that and also thank Pastor Carlos for being with us this weekend. And we invite you now, Pastor Carlos, to come and bless us one more time. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. Alrighty. Alrighty, my friends, are you ready to go? Yes. Buckle up your seats and let's do this together, okay? We are finishing the book, I mean, the chapter, chapter four of the book of John today. Is that good? Actually, no, we're not finishing. We're only going to verse 42. There's a few more verses and another story in the chapter. But we're only concentrating on those first 42 verses of John, the gospel according to St. John at, uh, you know, 1 to 42. So I'm going to invite you to bow your head so we can pray. Okay. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. And we are so thankful, Father, that what you have done, we could not do for ourselves. And uh, here we are, Father, able and willing to learn, to be poured into. Uh, we open up our hearts, our minds. Please speak to us. And more than anything, Father, allow our decision-making, our brains, our, uh, the way we understand things, uh, allow those things to take place in our hearts uh, so that it won't just be another sermon and another presentation of many in the past and many to come, but that he would actually do something in our hearts and in our minds, in our decision-making more than anything, so that we can respond, Father, to such an amazing love that you have for each one of us. Father, I pray that the Spirit uh, will lead and that you can bless us along the way. And so we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, how many of you ate too much? I was trying not to because I wanted to preach, but it's your fault. I mean, the table was like a mile long, and I was good in the first three quarters of the table, but then I kept going, and I think you had the same problem, right? <laughs> but anyway, let's uh, do this together, dear friends. Like I said, today's presentation is going to deal with uh, chapter 4, verses 25 all the way to 42, but we're going to take it little by little. We're going to uh, take just portions and then talk about, the, about those. So let's go to John chapter uh, 4, verse 25 and 26. This is a conversation, once again, that this young lady is having with Jesus. And she says, I know, actually, anyway, I can see it if you can, sorry. Um, she says, I know that the Messiah is coming. And then in parenthesis, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And so the comment I wanted to make in this part, and we'll probably visit it again, is that oftentimes, because we live in between the time where we are here and then Jesus is to come, and so we have this, this eschatological idea that only means the end of time, that, that things are going to be better when Jesus comes and that right now we just have to endure all this craziness. 
But let me tell you, the Bible teaches something a little bit different. The Bible teaches salvation, which is the word salvation, and healing is basically the same word in the Bible. And so the Bible teaches that salvation and healing is actually something that God wants to do here and now. That work begins here and now. And then, yes, one day, with the, you know, we talked about the rope of righteousness that will cover us and will take us through eternity as, as perfect beings because the Spirit of God is, is fully in us. But the reality is that there is a responsibility now that God has taken upon him to bring healing and to bring peace and to bring all these good things to your life now, here, and today. And so don't you only think about the end time, which is good, but also think about today. What is it that God wants to present to you? What is it that God wants to do to you? What is it that God is working within your life to make you a better individual so that you can have a better relationship with him? And so she says, I know the Messiah is coming in the future. I have the knowledge uh, and when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And then Jesus responds with probably the most important thing that Jesus says throughout the history of his speaking to people. And he says, I am he, the one that is speaking to you. We'll talk more about this, but I want you to know, I want you to notice that God reveals himself to this lady and that he does it in a way that she has no more doubts of who he is. He says to her, I am the Messiah that was to come or that is to come. I am him. I am talking to you today. And that is an amazing thing, friends, because, um, you know, we, sometimes we think and we look at life and at spiritual life as if God was kind of trying to hide or, or he, we don't always know where he's at and what he's doing. The truth is that God is always willing to reveal himself to us. He's always willing to do that. And he sometimes will allow you to go through some things in life so that he will reveal himself to you. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one that will come, but the one that is here with you today. And so that is very important, friends, because once again, there is a tension between the time now and the time when Jesus is going to come. And yes, that's going to happen. It's been promised. God never breaks his promises. He will do that in time. Whenever he sees it right, when the time is right, he will come. But the truth is that he is already here with you and that he is doing everything that you need so that you can continue to grow and be like Jesus in every aspect of your life, okay? And then after that, the Samaritan woman uh, knew about the Messiah because she had started in sacred writings of Moses. And it's interesting, Deuteronomy 18, 15 says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. And so... Uh, the comment that Ellen G. White has on this specific part is that this, uh, this lady knew Scripture. She had studied Scripture. She actually was a, a Messiah follower, per se. She believed the Messiah was going to come. She had the hope that one day Jesus will come. And so once again, let me stress this point again. The reality is that we live in that tension of life where we are waiting for the Messiah, but at the same time, the Messiah is here with you, present in your life. And so it's in between that tension of life that we live our lives where we are waiting for him. And one day, uh, today I think my sister over here, what was your name, sister, back here? Carmen? Yes, that's right, Carmen. Carmen says, was it you or the lady next to you? I don't remember. But somebody says, I wish I could see God's laugh, the laughter of God. And I said, we will see it one day, right? But in so many regards, dear friends, God is here with us. And in the book of Matthew, Matthew, you don't see Jesus going anywhere at the end of time because in Matthew, Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Son of God has come to be with us in the book of Matthew. And, and so every, every gospel has their own emphasis. But the reality is that we, we live in those two realities. He's coming, but 
but he's here and he is blessing us. And so this lady knew the, about the Messiah, but now the, the Messiah has revealed her, himself to her right in front of her eyes. The plain statement of Christ could not have been made to the self-righteous Jews. That, that is a very, very telling thing. And by the way, that's in the Zion of Ages. Very, very telling. God called the Jew people to be able to um, allow them, from the, from the people, he was going to take the gospel all over the world, right? That's what he did. You understand the rebellion and all these different things. And so, Ellen G. White says that he could not reveal himself the way he did to this lady, to the Jews, because of their pride. Because of their pride. That is very, very telling. These are the religious people. These are, let me just put it in context, these are the seven-day Adventists, but God could not reveal himself uh, to the seven-day Adventists because of pride. And so God chose a very unlikely person to reveal himself. I know that a number of years ago in my conference, uh, there was a congregation at Seventh-day Adventist Church that uh, there was a situation and a number of individuals got up from the church and left and created their own church. It happened about five years ago, four years ago. And so part of the reason why they did that is because they wanted to do certain things that we couldn't do because of the way our church is structured. So they came out of the church, and then they established their own little church, and they are doing amazing things for the Lord. They have this ministry in the city of Las Vegas. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but in Las Vegas, there is what they call the mold people underneath the city in the sewer system which is very complicated under the whole strip there are there are just like a little city underneath and thousands of people live there and a lot of them are drug addicts some of them are running from the justice some of them are mental health and but hundreds of people live there and there is homeless people and they live in very very poor conditions every time it rains some of them will die because they living under the the sewer system under the city and so these individuals these friends of us have created have this church and are rescuing a lot of people and so somebody told me the other day yeah those bad people that left the church and they say you know those bad people that left the church are doing the work that we cannot do because they are set up to do specifically that. And so we can be fighting with people and mad at someone that is doing the, 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 building the kingdom of God. And that they are, have a ministry that they're doing amazing things. The reality is, friends, that it's not about the title that we possess as seven-day Adventists. It's about work. It's about the ministry that God has given us. It's about reaching the world. And it, sometimes we'll do it from within, and some people will come out and do that work. And praise the Lord that the kingdom of God is advancing, and the people, especially those who are very, very down on luck and poor and addicted and doing all these bad things, especially them are waking up to the beauty of who God is and how much He cares for them. And so we, we have to be careful that, that it's not the title of Seventh-day Adventist, the, the one that, the, the, that matters to us, but it is actually the presence of Jesus living within you that has made and makes a difference every single time. Jesus saw the, that she would make use of the knowledge in bringing others to share his grace. That's another thing that really touches my heart. Um, God could have gone through the right channels. Jesus could have gone through the right channels, could have gathered the disciples and says, okay, guys, we are going to do an evangelistic campaign here in Samaria, and uh, you, Peter, are going to be in charge of preaching. You're going to pick up the offer. He could have done that, but he chose not to. Why? Because they were not ready for it. They had all these hang-ups in their mind. They thought the Samaritans didn't deserve to be loved by God. And so God has to go through an individual that is very unlikely to be able to bring the gospel of salvation to the people in Samaria. And that's the beauty about God. God doesn't need our systems. and our, He only needs your heart, your willingness, your desire to serve Him. That's what He needs. And that's what you and I can offer Him so that we can finish this work and we can go home. 
Are there things that God has kept from me because of my self-righteousness? And do you see the difference? We're talking about Christ's righteousness and then self-righteousness. Christ's righteousness, self-righteousness. There, are in, there is a problem right there. When I think it's all about me and all about what I believe and what I have and what I can offer. And then when I completely understand that it's really not. It's about the blood of Jesus that was shared at the cross of Calvary. And what that means to me today. Not just for my salvation, but also for my responsibility of reaching out to those who don't know Jesus. That's what matters. Is that there is a difference there. And so God is not interested. I mean, we go back to the Old Testament in, in the things we do and, and the way we, we, we do certain things. God is interested in your heart. He cares for the depths of your heart, of who you are, and what He can do to you. And oftentimes, uh, one individual, I remember I came to, I, I was a pastor of a church in Las Vegas, and then I would go around and talk to people and say, Sister, how long have you been in church? Oh, seven years. And uh, how do you come into the church? Oh, Brother Susan Schatz brought me in. Man, it's like 90% of the church was brought in by one man. Just one man. One guy. Can you imagine if all of us were doing the job of bringing people into the foot of the cross? It was just one guy who was doing all the work in the church, a church of, I don't know, 600 members in Las Vegas. Let's go to verse 27 to 30. Uh, the Bible says, Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. And so I just kind of put a play of word here to say that the silence of the disciples spoke volumes. You know why, right? Because you know what they were thinking, right? Ah, oh, Jesus again, making us look bad. Doesn't he know? He's not supposed to be talking to a woman. He's not supposed to be get, giving them any advantage over us. They're not like us. Why would Jesus do that? But they kept silence. You know why? Because they knew that Jesus always, always had a reason to do whatever he did. And so they were trying to be careful. But Ellen G. White says that they, in their hearts, they were saying, Oh, no, this is, this is not good. This is a disaster. And so how many times, dear brothers and sisters, we have come to church and we have seen the work that is being done and we're like, oh, no, now the pastor really blew it this time. Why would he allow those kind of people to come here? Why would he do that? And sometimes we're not like the disciples. We do talk and we do share and we complain, right? At least the disciples were quiet. They didn't say anything, right? Uh, the Samaritan woman leaves her water jar behind. This is very significant. Let me tell you why. Because remember, she came to get water, right? That's the reason why she came. Water in those years, like it is now, it's very important. It's a very important thing to be able to, to, be able to live your life. And so water was a very important element that she had come to get. But then her, the act of leaving the jar behind meant that her needs are now fulfilled. That the one reason why she came, the need that she, that she had to come, which is the water, was not fulfilled. So in many regards, what John is trying to tell you is that somehow she was able to say, you know what, the water that you are offering is much better than this water. I don't need this water anymore. I, I'm taking the living water that you are offering for me today. The other significant thing about that, brothers and sisters, especially for those of us who have had our differences and our problems, is that we have to leave our past in the hands of God. We have to leave our jar behind. We have to abandon it there and go and live our lives because God has given us a new opportunity to live a life. We cannot hold on to all these things that are so heavy 
uh, in our lives. I remember the preachers when I was a kid of the man who had a big old, big old uh, bag in his, in his shoulder and then some guy offered him a ride. Remember that illustration? In his truck and the guy says, oh, thank you so much. And he goes into the truck with the big old bag on, on his shoulder and he's holding for dear life in the truck and the thing is on top of him. And then the guy stops and says, sir, put it down. You don't have to. He says, oh, no, no, you're already doing too much for me. You're already taking me. You don't want to take my bag too, you know. And so it was an illustration that pastors use to say that sometimes we're willing to go so far with God, but we're not willing to let everything go in, in, in front of Him or for Him or before Him. And that's what God wants. God wants to free you to live the life He has meant for you to live. And oftentimes, dear friends, He takes a lot of work and He takes, uh, you know, help. So that we can leave our jars behind and we can begin to live the life that God has given us. The Samaritan will quickly engage in sharing the good news of Jesus. Did you notice that? Did you notice that she, she didn't say, well, I'm going to take six months to think about what you're telling me. She simply says, man, I'm out of here. People need to know what this man told me. And it's very interesting how she phrases the Samaritan woman announced in his Bible, he knows me and loves me anyway. It's so significant to me how the devil works. And let me tell you, because, because we a lot of times are afraid to open up our hearts to God fully so that he can see exactly who we are in the, de in the depths of our heart. And we, we, we are afraid of being exposed but it is in that exposure that we have before God that there is healing. And that opportunity to be able to abandon everything right there. And so she's, this woman's most impacting thing is he knows about all these failed marriages that I had. She knows that, I'm, that nobody really wants to be my friend. She knows everything. He knows everything about me. And yet he's still willing to give me the living water. And brothers and sisters, there is no more, more powerful testimony than an individual who realizes that in spite of everything, God is willing to give them this living water. And there is nothing you can do after that other than to go tell somebody else. Amen. Go tell someone else how amazing this guy was that was able to recognize, understand everything about her, and yet he's still willing to love and to be a part of their life. But we do it a little bit different, right? Sometimes we're looking for the hiccups and the problems on people's uh, lives so that we can keep away. We don't want to contaminate ourselves, right? But that's not what Jesus does, my friends. Jesus is always there. She was liberated by the transforming power of re Jesus' righteousness. He would, she was liberated, and that's the beauty about Christ. No, the Bible says that the truth shall set you free. And, and the truth is that God loves you. That is the truth. That's the reason why he came. That's the reason why he went to the cross. That's the reason why he went back to the Father. Because he loves you. He loved you since he created you. That is the truth. And that in itself is liberating. Because it, it frees you to live and to do all these different things. And to love. There's nothing more powerful than loving the people around us. It makes you happy. It makes them happy. It makes everybody happy. And so that's the beauty of a Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness is the ability to understand that we are loved and that other people are loved. And that we can be together. And we can serve one another. And we can grow together. And that there is a place that is prepared for each one of us to live eternally with Him soon when He comes for the second time. So we go to verse 31 to 34. Meanwhile, the disciples were arguing with Him. Rabbi, eat something. But He said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. You know, Alan G. White says that, um, that when they came to see Jesus, 
when they came back and they saw him talking to the lady and everything, that there was a shyness to his face. And that's part of the reason why they just didn't say anything because they saw that there is some sacredness about Jesus speaking to this needy woman. Then his face was shining. And so they, they kept away and they didn't say anything. But here is the deal, dear friends. Every time God comes to you to supply the needs of your life, there is a sacredness to that. And every time we do the same, we participate, we, we, we become co-participants of the sacredness of who God is. Remember, the reason why we love one another and we respect one another is because the presence of the Spirit lives within us. In that sense, we're temples. And in that sense, we're sacred. Not because we are clean, but because the presence of God is in us. And so that's what the disciples are able to see. And that's what happens every single time you and I get out of ourselves and become a blessing to the people around us. There is growth to be had by serving our neighbor. We are blessed. We are able to grow. The presence of God moves in a more free way every time we do that. And so listen to what she says here. As his words to the woman had aroused her conscience, Jesus rejoiced. He saw her drinking of the water of life, and his own hunger and thirst were satisfied. The, accom the accomplishment of the mission which he had left heaven to perform strengthened the Savior for his labor and lifted him above the necessities of humanity. Remember, he was a man. He was hungry. He was thirsty. By the way, I, I, I didn't have anybody commenting in, the, in my studies, but I don't think Jesus ever got the water. I don't know if he did. I don't know if he did. The Bible doesn't say, and nothing implies that eventually she says, okay, here's some water, drink. Because he was thirsty and hot. But it's very significant to me to understand and to know that as she began to open up and as she began to receive the living water that Jesus was suffering, that satisfied the needs of the Savior, even his physical needs. And he was happy and joyful. And listen to what she says here. She says, the accomplishment of the mission which he had left heaven to perform, strengthened the Savior for his labor, and lifted him above the necessities of humanity. And then she says, to minister to a soul hungering and thirsting for the truth was more grateful to him than eating or drinking. I know I'm addicted to food. I've been eating about two or three times a day for 52 years, and I still don't want to stop. Some of you have been doing it for longer, right? That's right. Thank you. But to minister to a soul hungering and thirsting for truth was more grateful to him than eating or drinking. It was a comfort, a refreshment to him. Benevolence was the life of his soul. And dear friends, we are children of God. We were made by God. We are no different. We were made to serve one another. We thrived in service. We thrive when we look beyond our own necessity and our own things and look at other people. We thrive in those things. It is important that we do it. It's good for us. It's good for God. It's good for the church. It's good for salvation. It's good for the people around us. It's a good thing to do. That's the way Jesus lived his life. And everything that we find in the book of Corinthians reminds us that everything that, that is registered in Scripture is given for our instruction, for us to learn. Especially when it comes to Jesus, we need to look at him and repeat and, and learn from him and the way he loved the people around him. Verses 35, 37, did you not say four months more than comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is, all, is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. And so one of the things that Ellen G. White describes that I really appreciate is that as Jesus is talking to them, he looks around 
and he sees the fields and he sees that there is a, still a few months for them to come but then he makes a, a very important he he repeats something that is very important the fields are right the fields are right and the truth is dear friends is that people are suffering everywhere is that people are feeling lonely everywhere the people need help everywhere and we you and i have been sent to supply those needs, to point them to the right direction. Pastor Rudy, you, Rudy, you remember the definition of uh, evangelism from John Wesley? Remember that? We, if we study in school, you better remember. The definition of evangelism, according to John Maxwell, was, was um, John Wesley, sorry, not Maxwell, uh, was a beggar finding bread and then going to tell someone else where he can go and find bread. And that's who we are, dear friends. We don't deserve any of the gifts that God has given us. We didn't deserve the salvation that God has given us. We are beggars that were given this amazing bread. And it is our responsibility to go back and tell the other beggars where they can find this amazing bread and this living water that is so needed for everybody's soul. All of us need it. And so the, the, the fields are ripe, dear friends. People are in need everywhere. And you have been called to do the work, to share those good news of Jesus Christ, where our labor is required in Christ, and we're all on this together. It doesn't matter if you, if you sow or if you... It doesn't matter. What matters is that you are together working so that others can receive the beauty of who Jesus is. One of the most amazing gifts of Christ's righteousness is unity in the body of Christ. And that's what happens. Unity within the body of Christ is vital because unity and, and, and division are two opposites in, in many regards. And so the devil is trying to, 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 to sow this division everywhere he goes. And that's why churches fall apart and pastors fall apart and pastoral families fall apart and all these things fall apart. And your family will fall apart because the devil is trying to cause division. And the opposite of that is understanding that we are all members of the body of Christ. And there is unity because it doesn't matter if you're a leg or, a, or an arm or an eye or the hair. It doesn't matter. We are all the body of Christ. And we work in unity because of the presence of the Spirit that unifies all of us. And so that is one of the most amazing gifts of the Spirit for each one of us to understand and to know that we are members of the body of Christ. And as members of the body of Christ, there is certain responsibilities that we do have and that we need to accomplish, right? Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. Once again, she repeats it again. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him, to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, but for we, uh, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but it um, seems like that this was the first evangelist in the Bible. This is the first person who had an encounter with Jesus and then went back to her people and told them everything that she heard from Jesus. And they came to him and then he spent days with them and many people believed because of the testimony of these women. And so, you know, it, it, one of the things I want you to notice is that, you know, we have set out these this, this systems that keep us organized, but that at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because God can call you to do amazing things for his kingdom. You do understand that this work is not going to be finished by pastors and teachers. This work is going to be finished by you, by those of us who simply love Jesus with all our hearts and are willing to do what God, are willing to participate, to work with God in whatever God is asking you to do. And so it's significant that this woman... First of all, is a woman. Secondly, she's not a very good reputation woman, and she becomes the first evangelist, at least in, in, in the Gospels, um, in the Bible. Very unlikely person. 
And then the other thing that is interesting to see is the progression of faith from bar of faith to own faith. And so, you know, one of the classes that I took in my master's is uh, what they call faith development. Faith is developed just like personality. Remember Eric Erickson? The, he has these different stages of where personality is developed. And well, faith is the same way. That's the reason why it's so important that little kids understand the love of God at their age because there comes a time when they're going to go from borrowed faith, from the faith of their parents, and then they're going to own their own faith. I remember when I was a youth pastor, I, would, I was pastoring a Spanish church, but yet the kids don't speak Spanish. They all speak English, right? They, every single one of them, every single day, all the conversations was in English because they're from here, right? They were born here. They, they grew up here, even though they're Hispanics. But then I asked them to pray, and you know what they did? They pray in Spanish. You know why, right? Because all their experience, spiritual experience, was borrowed from their parents. And their parents prayed in Spanish, so they prayed in Spanish. But some of them didn't even know Spanish that well. And then I say, wait a second, pray in English. And it was like uh, turning a switch on in their lives. Really, can I? Of course. You know God is bilingual, right? <laughs> and so they began to pray in English, and then I could see and I could understand that they were passing from borrowed faith to own faith. And this is exactly what happened. This woman goes and shares what Jesus has done to her. And then they, they are amazed and they come. But then they eventually confess, we don't believe now because of what you said. Because now we have seen Jesus. And that is the progression, brothers and sisters, that we need to see in our churches. Yes, we must come here because there is a cooking class that somebody is interested in. But they have to come from bar faith all the way to own faith where you become responsible before God for who He is and what He's doing in your own life. I think this is the last slide of the day. This is what it says. This woman represents the working of practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes the giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. There is a lot of things in Scripture, brothers and sisters, that reminds us that the way to grow in spirituality is, is always an active thing. It's always a verb. It's not, a, it's not anything else. It's always active. And so we grow as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. We cannot, you know, the, I have this image in my head uh, by the way, you don't want to get into my head because I think funny things. But I have this image of an individual uh, in a hammock in Jamaica, right next to the beach, swinging in the beautiful evening breeze, saying, Lord, please give me more faith. <laughs> please give me more faith. And then I have this other image in my head of a guy who's running away from a lion and saying, Lord, increase my faith. You know? That's how it happens. We cannot just come to church and sit down and, and evaluate if Pastor Rudy preached a good sermon or a great sermon because he doesn't have any bad sermons, right? Amen? Amen. We must be active in this work of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. That's how we grow. And that's what Jesus is showing here. That Jesus is willing to heal and to transform your life. But not for you to sit down and do nothing and just be thankful. It's for you to be able to tell the world. And as, as you tell the world and as you spend your life in service for the Lord. That you are able to grow even deeper in Christ Jesus. 
It is an amazing experience that we all get when we come into the presence of God and we receive all these amazing things, but the giver becomes the, I'm see, the receiver becomes the giver. That's what she says. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. Isn't that beautiful? Would you ever imagine that you'll become a fountain of life? Yes, you do. Why? Because God is in your life and it's not about you. It's about what Christ is doing. Christ's righteousness releases you to a better walk with Jesus today. I know that you began this series, not just mine, but the seven weeks are you going to be looking at uh, how is it that we can have a better relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, I tell you what, it is a gift from God. God is willing to do that to you. You have to get in touch with him. You have to look him up. You have to spend time in scripture. You have to spend, get to know him. Get to know him. And he's going to release you. He's going to allow you to go into these amazing things um, so that you can have a better walk with Jesus and that you can tell the world what an amazing God he is. Isn't it amazing to be reminded, friends, that God knows us and still loves us? Sometimes I can say that about my wife. Poor thing, she knows everything about me, but then she still loves me. And that's what God does, dear, dear friends. He's never ashamed of you. He's, he doesn't think you are bad. He thinks you're great. And he has the power to transform you. You know, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do to get away from the love of God. We can fight it. But God's love is there all the time pursuing us. And He's already did, done it all. The work of salvation was completed at the cross of Calvary. He did it all. Your sins have been forgiven. And the understanding, the knowledge, the appreciation of that is what releases you into becoming a servant for the Lord. Because you know that you are not perfect. You're still growing and learning. And there are still things in your life, but you're still willing to say, Thank you, Father. I love you back. Let me share the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you think this woman was perfect after talking to Jesus, no, she was the same lady, but there was a difference. She was now know that she had been forgiven and that there was something amazing about Jesus that people needed to know. And finally here, brothers and sisters, you are free to serve God. You are free to serve Him. You're not lacking anything. Jesus did it all at the cross of Calvary. You are free to serve God. You are released into his righteousness, the righteousness that covers multitude of sins, the righteousness that allowed you to know that even though you're still not there, then one day you will receive salvation and you will be with him. Allow me to finish by sharing just a little bit about me. Uh, when my father was born, less than a year old his father killed his mother so my father grew up without mom and dad because his mom had been killed and his father spent all of his childhood in jail and so my father did what he could but uh, he used drugs um, weed to be ex that right as a way of living throughout his life and even though my mother had been born in a seven day Adventist family uh, she was a church goer or since she was a little girl she somehow met my father and that's the family that I come from and I'm not gonna bore you with details about my life but I want you to know that you're not alone in pain and suffering, dear friend. You're not. Most of us have been casualties 
of this war of sin that the devil brought against God and against all his children. But we cannot stay there, dear friends. We cannot. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to God. We have to move past trauma and difficulties. And we have to see God for who he is. He is the God of the universe. He is a loving God. He's a compassionate God. He's a God that cares for every single detail of your life. And really, truly, it's not about me or about you. It's really about God and what he's doing. So I want to finish today. But before I finish, I want to hear probably two, per two people. Pastor Rudy, is that okay? Do I have a minute or two? Thank you. Um, just two people maybe just share a little testimony of what you think God has been speaking to you specifically this weekend what is God telling you that you feel like sharing with us as we cheer you on so that you can continue to grow in Christ Jesus and you become a witness of the amazing love of God as these women did is there one or two volunteers me <laughs> I'm in tears right now I still struggle with my past hmm. even though I've been an Adventist for over 20 years now mm -hmm. it still comes up sometimes yeah. and finally I got to the point where I was able to start writing and my the first book I wrote mm -hmm. was about my past and my yeah. life and how God saved me since then, I've been doing more writing than I've ever done before in my life. Mm -hmm. And to hear your story and what you're telling us is cementing me into the conviction. Amen. Um, I didn't ask God why evil things happen. Evil things happen because people can do some really stupid things. Mm -hmm. I've never had that question. But the question I did ask was, why am I still alive? I should have died so many times. But it was like God wouldn't let me go. And Amen. everything he has told me since then, I'm alive because I can tell somebody else how to get to their me out of their mess. Amen. And I don't care who you are or where you've been, what you've done or what has been done to you. It doesn't matter. If you let God, he'll take care of it. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But he does it. Yeah, work in progress. All of us are. Uh, but God is so faithful. He's not going to let you do that alone. He's going to be present in your life. Thank you for your courage to be able to share uh, those things with us. Appreciate that. And I will read the book. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? There's a gentleman over here. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you, Pastor, that uh, your, uh, your presence, your knowledge, your love for God was uh, very well taken in. One thing that resonated with me, the word he used often, compassion. And that uh, is that, uh, like, pick the word from our sister, cemented in me the importance to have compassion on others, knowing that, yeah, we are all imperfect. And, uh, you know, and the devil is using people to push those buttons mm -hmm. that eventually, by having compassion, we come to peace. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what uh, could be an adversity <clears throat> or temptation or uh, reacting or whatever it might be, the button. So they were there. And then another one that they were thinking the verse that you brought it up this morning, uh, from Ellen G. White, uh, I don't remember the, the, the contest, but uh, she was saying, um, the living water, according to her, in my mind, the living water, I, I only have the picture of, of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, 
river of living water flow out, will flow out from their heart. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it was the Holy Spirit, but according to what uh, she said, uh, I, can't, I can't quote it, but the idea is that the living water is the revelation of, of the words. Mm -hmm. That yes. put in a, a huge uh, contest, because now I'm thinking more, yes, the, you know, when he said, in my words abide in, in, in you, you will ask anything. So the importance of, uh, of having his word in our heart, because if the living word, uh, his word are in our heart, right? So then out of our heart, this means out of our intention, our dream, our motives, come from him. Mm -hmm. they are, their word are changing us literally from within. And therefore, is a, anyway, thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. The world is dying, dear friends, without Jesus. And you and I have been given this gift. We must tell the world. They need to know that Jesus loves them dearly. If no one, oh, there's a young man on the back there. Thank you. I think I've, I've learned and appreciated uh, the fact that uh, there is a caring and listening person who is there, right there, even in my midst of my lowest moments. And one thing amazing that I found is that five husbands have really rejected him. The sixth one is Jesus, he's listening to him. And lo and behold, when Jesus comes again the second time, it will be the seventh husband who will be welcoming him, or her, or me, or you to the New Jerusalem, and that will be so happy for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, thank you, my friend. All right, I am going to invite Pastor Rudy. Please come up here. If you have a mic on, I'll, I'll appreciate that. Uh, I am going to ask Pastor Rudy to end with prayer. Uh, Pastor, I, I, sh I shared this with you, but I'll say it again. Um, I love your church. I find the members of the church to be loving, to be kind, to be accepting. Uh, just today, we have a visitor that I already told her she's staying in this family. And, uh, and, and I think it's a reflection of the work that you have done, Pastor. And I want to affirm that in you. And I want you to pray today, not just not for me, but for what God is doing. Uh, throughout the seven weeks of individuals coming to speak and so that God continue to put a foundation in the hearts of each one of us here so that this church can be a light to the world. So I'll, I'll invite you to pray if you're so kind, my friend. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for the word, for the messages that were delivered this, this morning, even last night as well thank you lord because of the this this just simply reminded us of how good you are to us even though we don't deserve you you have given us more than what we will ever imagine and so we want to pray lord that as as we continue with this seven weekends father that your love will shine through every single message so Amen. much that we will fall in love afresh with you and we will want to tell everyone about this relationship that we want with you, that we have with you, and that you want with others. Yes. Father, Amen. thank you again for the instrument you decided to use this week. And I pray, Father, that you will continue using him as you have done all these years. I pray for his family as well, uh, every single member in that picture. You know um, their desires and dreams. And Father, you are the only one who can fulfill all of them and even beyond that. Father in heaven, I pray your blessings upon this church. And uh, as Pastor Carlos said, he already is in love with this church. Imagine me being five years here, mm -hmm. Father. Amen. This is a loving church, and Amen. I praise you for giving me the opportunity to serve you here. Yes. Father in heaven, uh, proclaim your name, proclaim your, uh, your glory, and thank you again for blessing us so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you. you, my friend. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank Appreciate you. it. God bless you. you. We have we have one more song to close our, our meetings. Uh, our prayer team will come up and have a
Church, please stand with us as we sing our theme song to close off our service. Heavenly Father, you are truly the God of the universe. And Father, we come before you, Lord, and we worship you because you are worthy, Father. Because what you have done, we could never do. And what you're doing now, we could never do. And what you're about to do, Father, is the only hope that we have in this world. And Father, we praise you. We honor your name, Father, and we commit our lives before you, Lord, so that you can utilize us for ministry, for service, so that the world will know, Father, that you are the Son of God and that very soon you will come. And so that many of us, Father, will walk into eternity with you, 
Father, we submit our families, our spouses, our children, our parents, uh, the people that we love, every single one of them, Father. We submit it um, under your care so that you can bless them, you can be with them. But Father, more than anything, we submit our lives before you so that we can be utilized for ministry. Father, I know that you want to heal us, make us whole, completely bring healing to our lives. And that is a process that has already started, and we are a part of that, Father. But allow us not to sit down and wait for complete healing. Allow us to be together with you in ministry as we share the good news of Jesus, as you heal us, Father, and as you make us into one as the disciples were at the beginning so that we can finish this work, Father. Yes. Lord, thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you for your love. We pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God, Pastor, Pastor Carlos, before, before we uh, dismiss, uh, and we understand many people have prayed over you, but we want to also have that privilege to pray over you. I want to invite the, the elders. Could you come up, please? And uh, just we are going to offer a prayer for you as you are blessed as we also want to bless you. Um, yes, please, come, come, come. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Daryl and Sister Dottie to, Elsa is not here? Okay, let's, uh, Daryl and then Dottie.